بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أما بعد continuing on in our series of lectures we reach the third principle from the four principles of Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahhab rahimahullah ta'ala which are the is a very important treatise regarding the matter of Tawheed al-Ibadah as with most of the treatises of the Shaykh that they deal with the concept of Islamic monotheism and more specifically regarding the worship of Allah alone subhanahu wa ta'ala and we came to the point where we reached the third principle with the first principle being that the original pagans they used to believe in rububiyyah they used to agree with the concept that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was the Lord of the heavens and earth the Rabbil Alameen and that he was the creator and sustainer the provider the one who gives life and death they agreed to this however they did not worship him and him alone so this is where they fell into shirk this is where they departed from the Muslims from the belief of Islam and this is why they were not considered Muslims and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam fought jihad against them fi sabilillah subhanahu wa ta'ala so this is the was the first uh, principle the Shaykh mentioned that agreeing to the lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone is not sufficient to enter one into the fold of Islam the second principle had to deal with the concept that intercession should only be sought from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Ahl Sunnah believes in and affirms the intercession of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam but that this is a matter that will happen in the hereafter not in this life so we do not supplicate and seek intercession from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam nor the angels nor the other prophets alayhim afdal salatu wa sallam nor the saints nor the other religious figures or anyone or anything besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this life intercession is only to be sought from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we supplicate and worship him directly without anyone or anything between us then now we've come to the third principle the third principle from amongst the four principles the Shaykh said the third principle he said rahimahullah ta'ala the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam encountered people who worshipped many things some worshipped the angels some worshipped prophets and saints while others worshipped rocks and trees and still others the sun and the moon and he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fought them all and did not differ between them and the evidence for this is the statement of Allah the Almighty and fight them until there is no more fitna meaning disbelief or polytheism and the re religion will all be for Allah so it shows us that no matter what people call it no matter who the people worship besides Allah it's all considered shirk it's all considered disbelief whether you worship someone righteous and holy or you worship someone wicked and filthy it is all considered disbelief because worship only belongs to Allah the deen kulluhu lillah the religion is all for Allah 
And this is what the Prophet Sallallahu illustrated for us, this perfect concept of monotheism. The evidence, the Shaykh went on to say, the evidence that the sun and the moon were worshipped is the saying of Allah the Almighty, and from His signs is the day and the night. The sun and the moon. Do not prostrate to the sun or the moon. Prostrate to Allah who created them if it is Him you really worship. وَمِنْ عَيَاتِ يَلَيْلُ وَالنَّهَارُ وَالشَّمْسُ وَالْقَمْرُ لَا تَسْجِرُوا لِلشَّمْسِ وَلَا لِلْقَمْرُ وَاسْجِرُوا لِلَّهِ الَّذِي خَلَقُهُنَّ إِن كُنْتُمْ إِيَّاهُ تَعْبُدُونَ If it is Him that you really worship, then prostrate to Allah alone. There's no cause. There's no evidence. There is no authenticity or authentication for worshiping other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Regard, all of these are from his signs, they're from his verses, from his, his, uh, his ayat koniya, you know, the verses that are in his creation that are uh, things for us to ponder and reflect upon. From the sun, the moon, the night and the day, the sun and the stars. All of these are beautiful and vast creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the sea. However, they're not to be worshipped. They are not to be taken as lords besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nor do we prostrate before them, but we prostrate to Allah who created them. And that is, if it is Him you really worship. And the evidence that they worship the angels is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's statement, uh, statement. You are not commanded to take the angels and the prophets as lords. And the evidence that they worshiped prophets is a statement of Allah the Almighty. And when Allah will say, O oh Jesus, son of Miriam, do you say to the people, take me and my mother as gods besides Allah? He will say, glory be to you. It is not for me to say which I had no right to utter. Had I said such a thing, you would surely have known it. You know what is in my inner self and I do not know what is in yours. Truly you are the all knower of all that is hidden. The evidence that they worship the saints is a statement of Allah the Almighty. Those whom they call upon, like Jesus, Mer Maryam, those worship beings, desire a means of access to their Lord, as to which of them should be the nearest. And they hope for his mercy and fear his torment. And the evidence that they worship rocks and trees is the statement of Allah the Almighty, have you considered Allah wal Uzza and Manat the third? And also the hadith of Abi Waqid al Laythi radiallahu ta'ala anhu who said, We left Hunayn with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and we were new to Islam. The pagans had a tree they used to devote themselves to and hang their weapons upon called Vat al Anwat. So we passed by a tree and said, O Messenger of Allah, make us that al -anwat, come uh, uh, like they have that al -anwat. Shaykh Ahmed al-Najmi rahimahullah ta'ala states, This principle illustrates that everything which is supplicated to other than Allah, regardless of whether it is the angels, prophets, pious saints, or trees, rocks, or anything else that is worshipped, they are all incapable of assisting those who worship them with what they request or grant them an alternative. And Allah the Almighty has already mentioned that anyone who is supplicated to besides Him does not possess anything, nor even a little, when He subhanahu wa ta'ala said, And those whom you invoke or call upon instead of, of Him, O oh, not even the thin membrane over a date seed. If you invoke them, they hear you not. And if they could hear you, they could not grant your request. And on the day of resurrection, they will disown your worshiping them. And none can inform you like him who is well acquainted with everything. And the most magnificent said, O oh, you who believe, here is an example, so take heed of it. Verily, those who you invoke other than Allah cannot even create a fly, even if they gathered together to do so. 
There are many other verses which illustrate that those who invoke besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are unable to fulfill the request of those who worship them due to their frailty and weakness. And they are also incapable of preventing harm or benefiting themselves. So how about other than them? How is it that they can benefit you and I when supplicated to if they could not even benefit themselves? Those who are worshipped besides Allah, no matter what their status is, they are unable to fulfill our requests. And it constitutes polytheism by worshipping or supplicating to them. It does not matter if a person supplicates to an angel or to Jesus alayhi salatu wasalam, or Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, or a statue, an idol, a rock, or a dead saint. It all constitutes shirk and violates Islamic monotheism. The fourth principle, so the Shaykh moved on to the last and final principle. He said the fourth principle, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. He said, the pagans of our time are more polytheistic than the pagans of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's time due to the fact that the early pagans used to commit polytheistic worship during times of ease, but were sincere to Allah during times of difficulty. However, the pagans of our time commit polytheism during times of ease and hardship. The evidence for this is the statement of the Almighty, and when they embark upon a ship, they invoke Allah, making their faith pure for Him alone. But when He brings them to land safely, behold, they give a share of their worship to others. This principle illustrates the fact that both the pagans of this time and early pagans are considered disbelievers. Although the early pagans during times of great hardship worshipped, they worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and recognized His Lordship. Therefore, all those who disbelieve in Allah, His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the religion will abide eternally in the hellfire. However, some will receive a punishment more severe than others in accordance with the level of their shirk and sinfulness. The pagans in the Arab Peninsula during the time of the writing of this treatise by Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, believed in the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the Day of Judgment, the angels, and they uttered the testimony of faith. However, they violated Tawheed al-Ibadah because they sought blessings from trees, stones, and dead saints, and these were their habitual practices. On the other hand, the early pagans rejected the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Day of Judgment, but they did not worship Allah by supplicating, uh, I'm sorry, but they did worship Allah by supplicating to Him during difficult times. So sometimes they worshiped Allah and sometimes they didn't worship Allah. Sometimes they had a degree of sincerity and other times they totally violated that by worshiping other than Allah, using them as intercessors. The shirk of the latter day pagans was worse than the early pagan Arabs. However, their disbelief varied and it was all considered disbelief. The four principles that Shaykh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab rahimahullah ta'ala mentioned were standards in which to distinguish polytheism from monotheism and pagans from monotheists so that there would be no confusion or deception regarding the various practices and acts of worship they do. Because some polytheists pray and claim love for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they perform the pilgrimage to Mecca and fast. However, they associate partners with Allah and seek intercessions from other than Him. And many of them, they worship various deities seeking to draw nearer to Allah, which does not benefit them. Finally, another matter pertaining to these principles is the issue of takfir. 
meaning to declare a Muslim to be an apostate. This is imperative that we have some basic understanding about this. Takfir is a very serious issue that is left to the scholars and Islamic judges to determine and apply a judgment upon an individual. As the scholars uh, illustrate for us that takfir is of two types. Takfir al-mutlaq wa takfir al-ma'ayyin. Takfir al-mutlaq means the general takfir. Takfir al-ma'ayyin is the specific takfir, meaning that you're making the judgment about a particular individual. Takfir al-mutlaq, the general judgment, is for example, if you say the Jews and Christians are disbelievers. That means you have made takfir of Jews and Christians in the general sense. That means anyone who fits that description of being considered a Jew or a Christian is not a Muslim. They are outside the fold of Islam. That is takfir mutlaq. Takfir al-ma'ayin is when we try to apply that specific ruling of takfir to a specific individual. For example, to say so-and-so is a disbeliever and their origin is that they're a Muslim. Okay, someone who has entered the fold of Islam, we know them to be a Muslim or to be from the Ummah, even if they be from a various groups and sects, but they're still regarded as a Muslim. They may be from Ahl al-Bidah, they may be from Ahl al-Sunnah. However, when, you, when it comes to making a judgment upon that specific individual, that is a judgment for the scholars because there are conditions for this as we will begin to uh, give a very brief overview. The important principle for us here and related to this treaties, as well as other treaties of Muhammad ibn al-Wahhab like Nawaqid al-Islam, the, the uh, violators or the inviolators of faith, those things which violate a person's faith, is that although a person may err, they may make a mistake, and do an action or say a statement that nullifies his or her faith, it does not necessarily mean they are a disbeliever because there are conditions and things which prohibit from making the ruling of takfir upon a specific individual. And this judgment is judged or is uh, determined by qualified scholars because it is very serious to make this ruling. So even if someone falls into something that violates their faith, for example, you know someone to be a Muslim and they utter a statement of disbelief or they do an action of disbelief or they uh, hold some creed, some aspect of creed, which is has to do, which takes them out of the fold of Islam. In this situation, instead of you as the layman, as from being from the general Muslims, making this uh, ruling against them, you need to go take that to the scholars. And if you're in a Muslim land, that will be taken to the Muslim judge. And they would, arbit they would be the ones to make this ruling, to determine, does this person have one of the things that prohibits from making takfir? Maybe they are, they have the excuse of ignorance. Maybe they have the excuse of being forced. Maybe they have the excuse of being a new Muslim. Or maybe they were crazy at the time. Maybe they, uh, what, whatever, those are some of the main things that prohibit from making takfir. So the conditions and must be in place before a person can make this ruling. And also this ruling is reserved for the scholars. So takfir or declaring someone, an innovator even, even someone from Ahl al-Bidah, or a sinner, or a wicked uh, sinner, are Islamic judgments. These are Islamic judgments, so they're very serious because rulings have, they have rulings attached to these things. Meaning if you make a, a mistake in this ruling, you also may have a punishment in the Sharia or at least a punishment in the hereafter with your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, its rulings are taken from Islamic law. And it's not for anyone to declare someone to be an apostate or sinner or innovator or to be misguided except with evidence. Also, another important aspect of this is that there has to be evidence. And this was a statement of Shaykh Abdulaziz al-Rajihi, Hafidhullah Ta'ala. So the important thing for us here is that this is such a serious ruling. 
that regardless all the things that we covered in this treatise show us that people can be in the fold of Islam or outside the fold of Islam in accordance with their belief. And are they practicing true Tawheed? But it is not for us as individuals to go and make these rulings and judgments on other individuals. That is reserved for the scholars to declare someone an apostate, to declare someone a wicked sinner or an innovator. Because, and at the same time, there must be evidence. Labud iqamata iqamat al hujja That you must bring evidence. You said such and such, and this is the evidence that it takes you out of the fold of Islam. So this is reserved for the scholars to clear the doubtfulness that person may have regarding this issue. The accusation that someone is heretical or has committed an act of apostasy must be established by sound evidence as slander is punishable under Islamic law. The Prophet ﷺ said, abusing a Muslim is fisk or fasuq, an act of disobedience. And killing him, or, or act of, of disobedience or wickedness, and killing him is an act of kufr, disbelief, meaning the minor disbelief, kufr dun al-kufr. And this was uh, collected, this was in a Sahih Muslim, and Imam Noah, we explained it. In another narration, which was collected by al-Bukhari, and explained by Ibn Hajr, the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever accuses a Muslim of disbelief, then it is if he killed him. It is as if he killed him. Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. These narrations exemplify the seriousness of making takfir. And that the one that does so carries an enormous responsibility. And should be a scholar of the religion. Because declaring a Muslim to be a disbeliever by mistake is a major sin. And both classical and contemporary scholars agree to this. That's imperative for us to understand because there are many groups and sects that have deviated like the Khawarij, like the modern day Tekfiris, neo Tekfiris, and others who declare their Muslim brothers and sisters to be disbelievers uh, more often than not without any proof or in accordance with their limited understanding, their weak understanding, their deviant understanding. وَعِيَاذَ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ أَهْلِ تَكْفِيرِ وَالْهِجْرَةِ Shaykh Ab, uh, uh, Abdul Nasir al-Baraq, Hafidhullah Ta'ala states, It is upon the Muslim to fear polytheism and ask his Lord to protect him from it in all of its various forms. Because polytheism overcame many of the creation from the early generations to those who will come last. We ask Allah to protect us from any and all forms of polytheism and from grave and saint worship to that of the Rafida, Shia. And may Allah guide the Muslims everywhere and protect them, preserve them, and preserve their aqidah. And bless us to be from Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Nabiyyana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. يا خاطب الحور الحسان وطالبا لوصالهن بجنة الحيوان أسرع وحوث السير جاهدك إنما مسراك هذا ساعة لزمان